display at Mount Rushmore on the 4th of July. Last year, the agency... Haunting images there. If you'd like to help people in Ukraine who may be in need of shelter, food, and water, please go to cnn.com slash impact and you'll find several ways you can help. All right, that wraps this hour of CNN Newsroom. I'm Kim Brunhuber and I'll be back with more breaking news coverage of the war in Ukraine. Right after the break, please do stay with us. This is how you imagine your dishwasher, but it may not be as clean as you think. Built up grease and lime scale could be hiding in your pipes. Try finished dishwasher cleaning. Its dual action formula hygienically cleans hidden lime scale and grease in your dishwasher. Finish, clean dishwasher, clean dishes. Selling a home is expensive and stressful. So we created our smart seller system to sell your home for top dollar and save you thousands in commissions. I was amazed in the fact that my house sold in one Day. Ideal agents saved me in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars in commission. The process was. As we explore Israel together through this book, my prayer is that you will see a church of Lakeport, maybe. When you could still get a cup. Time for you to try Nutrisystem with food that is new for twenty twenty. Proof guarantee. We're simply going to share. Bro. And as it turns out, it's not lifestyle roadmap for healthy brain are long gone.
Some are in ruins. A few have been restored. The two primary specialists are experts at fixing foggy and cracked glass. Looks great. You're all set. Thank you. What we can't fix is your view. Oh, hey, neighbor. Bring back any window with Glass Doctor. Six. Come on, guys. How come you ain't stretching? I gotta get some curtains. Eighteen-year-old daughter Alexis would be found alive. When we got to the mortuary, I heard her voice saying, of felonious assault, rape, and kidnapping. Megan's blood inside the truck. Crepe Corrector Lotion, only from... ...to help your kids learn all about President Trump's greatest achievements during his first term. That's why we're giving away the Kid's Guide to President Trump for free. This fun Kid's Guide will help your kids to understand everything President Trump has already accomplished for America. What's more, it's part of a very special gift bundle that includes a free kids magazine and a free video lesson, too. To learn more and order this free gift bundle, just visit FreeTrumpGuide.com. That's FreeTrumpGuide.com. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Get him prepped for medevac. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? You afraid of? Pretty open ended question, don't you think? 911 Spring Premiere this Monday, followed by Lone Star on Fox or Watts Anytime. March 27th on FS1. The road to the World Cup continues for the U.S. men's national team. Game on! Led by Inter. Today, while educating and inspiring the heroes of tomorrow. Land, your home. The following is a commercial program paid for by Aces Marketing. The opinions and views to restore territorial integrity and justice for Ukraine, or else Russia will face such losses that several generations will not be enough for it to rise back up. Ukrainian casualties are also mounting. Russian bombers struck army barracks in the southern city of Mykolaiv. Swedish journalists shot video of rescuers pulling one person from the debris. It's feared dozens of Ukrainian soldiers may have been killed in the attack. In the besieged port of Mariupol, drone footage shows utter devastation by Russian forces. A huge shopping mall stands gutted and burned out, along with blocks of charred apartment buildings. In the U.S., President Biden spoke for nearly two hours with China's President Xi Jinping, warning of unspecified consequences if Beijing assists the Russian side. We'll have more on that later this hour. Now, CNN has correspondents positioned around the world covering the story from every angle. We'll have reports this hour from Scott McLean in Ukraine, Ed Lavandera in Poland, Natasha Bertrand in Brussels, Delia Gallagher in Rome, and Caitlin Collins at the White House. Well, we begin with our Scott McLean live this hour in Lviv, Ukraine. Scott, uh, let's start with that deadly attack on the barracks. What's the latest there? Kim, this is a remarkable video that was taken by some Swedish, Swedish journalists from the CNN affiliate Expressen. They were there in the immediate aftermath, and they said that it looked like some five Russian bombs were dropped on this military base in Mykolaiv, where troops were present in the barracks. It's not clear at the time how many of them were taking cover in shelters, underground, or wherever, and that will obviously have a huge impact on the death toll. But in the immediate aftermath, uh, it is clear that there were casualties. Uh, you can see 
Uh, people from the barracks, rescuers trying frantically to dig through the rubble to pull people out. One man actually is pulled out. Miraculously, he looks uh, actually uninjured. Uh, one soldier told uh, that affiliate in, in Sweden that there were some 200 people present at the time, and he estimates that the vast majority of them would have been killed or injured. So it's possible that the number of casualties here is massive. Again, it, we're not in a position to clarify at this point. Mykolaiv is an important part of uh, Ru the, the Russian advance in Ukraine. It is a strategic city in the southern part of the country. It's also a place that the Russians have really struggled to capture. If they were to be able to take the city, they would be able to move west, open up a new front in Odessa, or they'd be able to move north and start attacking Kiev from the south. But so far, it doesn't seem like they've been able to do that. And so for the moment, it seems that they are content to lob explosives into the city instead. And Military bases, uh, military barracks, those have been par for the course for the, for the Russians. Just a week ago, there was a military base struck actually not far from here, about 11 miles or so only from the Polish border. In that attack, the Ukrainians say that 35 people were killed. The Russian estimates, though, are a lot higher, Kim. All right, and now let's turn to besieged Mariupol. We saw those uh, dramatic images from all the damage there. What's the latest there, and is there any update on the hopes that more people might actually be able to get out of that city? Yeah, so in terms of the humanitarian corridors, it does seem that there is at least a trickle of people getting through by private car. New satellite images show that there are some cars leaving the city headed west toward Brzezhansk, which is a city in Russian-controlled hands right now, and they are uh, supposed to make their way all the way to the city of Zaporizhia. That is the good news. The bad news is that there are still, it appears, people trapped under the rubble of that theater that was hit. Um, hit by a Russian airstrike. Uh, this was a place where Ukrainian officials say that some 1,200, 1,300 people were sheltering underground, and it actually had the word children written in large letters on the pavement outside to try to dissuade Russian bombers from striking that target, though it appears it didn't have any impact. And so yesterday we got word that some 130 people were pulled out of the rubble, and we don't know their condition. Uh, we are hoping that there are more, but uh, information has been sparse to come out of that area in part because local officials say the area has been shelled continuously. They say that some 50 to 100 times a day they're shelling in that city, Kim. Yeah, really a desperate situation there. And then, then finally, where you are uh, in Lviv, after that attack yesterday in a city that was seen as a, as a safe haven for, for residents and refugees who've been coming there from across the country, what's the feeling there now? Are, are people scared? Are they trying to leave from there as well? That is the fear, Kim. If you go out on the streets, life is still remarkably normal. This is one of the most beautiful cities I've ever been in. Um, people are still out doing their errands, going for coffee, eating out at, at restaurants. Um, and so it appears that life goes on. But obviously this city has, had been spared by Russian bombs. That is until yesterday when one struck right near uh, the airport here in Lviv. Now it doesn't appear that people from this area are too spooked because the airport is a place that you would expect the bombs to land. We've seen this in other cities in western Ukraine. Lutsk, uh, ivano frankivsk are... Uh, the two most recent examples where airport infrastructure has been targeted. And so um, it appears that people, many of them, are staying put for now. I actually spoke to one woman who had just arrived from Kiev, uh, fleeing bombing there. And I spoke to her and her daughter about how they were feeling here in Lviv. Watch. I'm also scared in this situation, but I like it here in Lviv. I want to stay here for some time. You feel safe here? Yes. Even after what happened this morning? Yes. So that's a 13-year-old girl, and it's remarkable, you know, even after those bombs falling, people still feeling remarkable, remarkably safe just because things are so, so calm in the city center. Obviously, the concern, though, is that if people do choose to leave, you will have a whole new flood of refugees headed for the border. The city officials here say that there are some 200,000 people taking shelter in Lviv alone, Kim. All right. I uh, really appreciate the reporting, Scott McLean. Thanks so much. Ukraine's military is claiming a major battlefield victory as it pushes back against the invading Russian army. CNN's Fred Plykin has the details. Another blow to Vladimir Putin's military. 
Ukrainian forces claiming they ambushed this convoy of Russian airborne troops. While CNN cannot independently verify the information, Russian state TV for the first time acknowledged that a senior airborne commander and several soldiers have been killed. While still outgunned, the Ukrainians feel they might slowly be turning the tide. The armed forces of Ukraine continue to deliver devastating blows at groups of enemy troops who are trying to consolidate and hold the captured defensive lines, a Ukrainian army spokesman says. The Ukrainians say they are launching counterattacks against Russian troops. This video allegedly showing an anti-tank guided missile taking out a Russian armored vehicle. They also claim they've already killed more than 14,000 Russian troops and shot down more than 110 combat choppers. CNN can't confirm those numbers, but the Russians haven't updated their casualty figures in more than two weeks, instead claiming what they call their, quote, military special operation is going as planned. Russia's defense ministry released this video of helicopter gunships allegedly attacking a Ukrainian airfield. Me. Still, Vladimir Putin clearly feels the need to rally his nation. Making a rare appearance at a massive rally at Moscow's main stadium, where a strange technical glitch cut off his speech, but not before he praised Russian troops. The best proof is the way our boys are fighting in this operation. Shoulder to shoulder, supporting each other, and if need be, protecting each other like brothers shielding one another with their bodies on the battlefield. We haven't had this unity for a long time. But the Russians appear to be so angry at U.S. and allied weapons shipments to Ukraine, they vowed to target any deliveries entering Ukrainian territory. And they're hitting strategic targets as well, firing several cruise missiles at an airplane repair plant near Lviv. While a Russian cruise missile dropped on a residential building in the capital, Kiev, after being shot down by Ukrainian air defenses. <laughs> Former world heavyweight boxing champ and brother of Kiev's mayor, Vladimir Klitschko, pleading for more help. This is genocide of the Ukrainian population. You have to act now. Stop passively observing and stop doing business with Russia. Do it now. The Biden administration has said more aid and weapons are on the way as Ukrainian forces continue to put up a fierce fight, preventing Russia's troops from further significant gains. Fred Plekin, CNN, Lviv, Ukraine. For more on all this, William Taylor joins me now. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and is vice president for Russia and Europe at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, you saw President Zelensky's message to Moscow uh, in which he said, uh, frankly and clearly, it's time to talk. Um, do you think, given how the war is going, um, that, that Russia will finally enter into good faith negotiations anytime soon? Kim, I think as you just reported, um, it's not going great for the Russian military. The Russian military has underperformed. It is not doing well. It's not able to sustain itself. It's not able to feed its troops in a lot of the places around these big cities that they've not been able to take. So and as that happens, that will be the indication that there is a possibility of negotiations. That is when it is clear to President Putin, who is the only decision maker on this question, when it is clear to him that it is not going well, when he is stalled, when his military has stalled, and the only way out for him is to sit down for negotiations, then that will be the time. President Zelensky has indicated he's ready to talk. President Zelensky has indicated that the, that the Ukrainians um, are going to continue to fight, um, and they are continuing to defend the capital and other cities. Uh, and and that's the key part of the question about negotiations. Um, it's, it's up to President Putin to decide, and he has to realize that his military is not accomplishing what he wants. Be all backed by magic tricks that I'm used to doing is uh, European diplomats and Ukrainian officials uh, about what it would like, like, look like if Ukraine assumed some form of neutrality. Uh, is, is that a viable off-ramp here? And if so, what might that look like? So President Zelensky has, has made it clear um, that he is determined to secure <clears throat> Ukraine. He's determined to provide security for his people. He's been interested, of course, in NATO membership. Um, as a way to 
provide that security. And it's now clear to him that that's not a near-term solution. Um, it's in their constitution, but he's realized that, that for now, it's not a solution. So he's looking for other ways, other formats, other examples of how European nations have provided security for themselves, who have been secure. One way um, is like Austria. Uh, but again, this is a, a question not for President Putin, not for Europeans. This is a question for Ukraine. This is a question for President Zelensky to decide if he wants to pursue this kind of an idea. He said mm -hmm. he's open to it. He said he's open to it. And that's that's the right question. Yeah, the, the Australian model would be, uh, Austrian model rather, would be that they, they own the military but, but not join any alliance, right? That is correct. It's the Austrian model that says, you know, Austrians, of course, are a member of the EU. That's important. Um, they're not a member of NATO. Uh, they do have their military. And the Ukrainians will demand a strong military for all kinds of reasons. They'll demand two things, Count. One is assurances, not just assurances, guarantees of their security from other nations, including the United States, including Germany, including all the members of the Security Council, they will demand those kinds of guarantees, number one. But as a backup, as an insurance policy, they will demand to have their own military, a strong military, as we're seeing right now. This is a strong military that the Ukrainians have right now. They will demand to keep that. Yeah. Let's pivot to China now. During the call with, President's, uh, Bi with President Biden, uh, Xi Jinping said both the U.S. and China have a responsibility for ensuring peace. So when it comes to China, uh, do, you, do you think that's likely or is it more likely to, to support Russia financially or even uh, militarily, which would obviously deepen the conflict? It would deepen the conflict, no doubt. However, the Chinese have denied um, that the Russians have asked for this military support and, and financial support. Just the fact that the Russians are asking for the support from China, that's a suggestion to me that President Putin recognizes he's in desperate shape. He needs help. Um, but on the Chinese side, they've not committed. The fact is they've said that they've gotten no such request, number one. Number two, the Chinese have been hesitant, have, have uh, held back in any expressions of support. When President Putin was there, was in Beijing for the opening of the Olympics, they issued this long statement between the two presidents, President Xi and President Putin. They didn't mention Ukraine once. The Chinese would not allow Ukraine to be part of that of that uh, announcement. And last thing, Kim, is the Chinese have abstained twice in the UN, in the Security Council and in the General Assembly. They have not supported Russia in either of the votes in the UN. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, certainly a, a strongly worded condemnation would, would go very far. So we'll see um, what happens uh, as they've been sort of going, playing both sides so far. Uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, Ambassador William Taylor, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your insights. Thanks, Kim. Good to be here. All right, coming up on Siena Newsroom, Ukrainian refugees flood across borders in hopes of reaching safety. We'll hear their stories of escape from the fighting now raging in their country. Stay with us. Rob did his best to so done. Go to the oven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Base, I'm listening to this soft. And the veg is looking good too. So now we're gonna go back here. People definitely say, what are you using? And I say meaning. And Gordon Chang on. And in that conversation about China, Stephen Mosier said he's concerned that in terms of these conversations with China, that Joe Biden is compromised. And that is something that, you know, we'll be talking a little later on about the, the, the laptop from hell. But this is something, um, this is what you don't want to even have to think about when your president is dealing with such high stake diplomatic conversations. Um, if you look at Hunter Biden, China, Ukraine, Russia, all places that the Biden family has had dirty deals in. So yeah, and a you, concern. If you, if you were to summarize the war in Ukraine right now, I call it the give me my stuff back war. And that's what that's yeah. what Vladimir Putin sees in Ukraine. That's yeah. what it would. That's what you could also call a uh, a war in uh, in Taiwan as well. Yeah. It would be that's give us true. our stuff back because in that call it was very very clear. Uh, Xi Jinping said Taiwan is part of China, and Joe Biden said 
Taiwan is not part of China. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, as you pointed out before the show started, Rachel, a couple of Chinese warships uh, sailed through the uh, Taiwanese Straits right before the talks. Could be a signal uh, of, hey, you know, whatever we talk about, we've got, we're, we're the big dogs in the neighborhood. What are we prepared to do? And what is China reading out on our preparation to do that? Uh, in, in Ukraine. Last thing I'll say, because I know we got to get the headlines, is this was talked about in the prior election about the consequences of em emboldening our, our, our enemies and taking China seriously, taking Russia seriously. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get to really talk about that in depth because we were so concerned about tone and tenor and mean tweets. And, and this is what you get. When you, when, you, when you govern an election based on emotion, you, pl you pay at the pipeline, at the gas pump, and you pay on a national security front. And I know people don't want to talk about that, but now it's, it's game time now, mm -hmm. and we're in a lot of trouble as a result of it. Yeah, anyway. you're, you're right. You kind of wish somebody else was in charge during yes. these troubling times. Exactly. All right, turning now to some headlines, starting with a... On the other hand, he's being very punitive. Enver Solomon, the Refugee Council. Great to see you this morning. Thanks very much for being with us. Uh, there's not an awful lot of good news around these days, is there? But this is definitely a bit of it. A rescue mission which illustrates Ukraine's spirit of defiance. Yesterday, in the city of Kharkiv, a missile struck a government building. But a phone call suggested there might just be a survivor in the rubble. Our correspondent John Sparks watched the rescuers ignore air raid warnings, all trying to find one man. The city of Kharkiv looks battered and bruised. Every street in every neighborhood has been touched by war. But there are some districts here that have been blown to bits. At 8.15 in the morning, a Russian missile sliced through the National Institute for Public Administration. Its three-story reception hall was reduced to a pile of dust. The fire department pulled one lifeless body from the debris and said 11 others had been injured. Then they received a telephone call from someone stuck under the rubble. They are digging furiously. Some with spades, some with their bare hands, but they've got so much work to do. There was a man in a crawl space, encased by bricks and concrete slabs, but a rescue worker called Daniel thought he knew where he was. Can you tell us what you saw? They use shovels and buckets, and they use their bare hands, for it was well below freezing, and the rescuers knew the man under the rubble wouldn't make it through the night. But they've had little rest over the past three weeks, and the tension was clear. Give me a blade that cuts wood, not a blade that cuts metal, said this rescuer. Give me that one, he begged. They worked under near constant shelling, with plumes of smoke marking the sky. The Russian military says it doesn't target towns and cities, but the streets of Kharkiv say otherwise. The sirens are going, and most of the search and rescue team are heading for cover. We're going to go with them, but there's still a few people in the remains of the building trying to get the man out. And a few minutes later, a man called Vladislav was released from his tomb. How are you? I asked. Better than ever, but I want a smoke, he said. And his rescuers were quick to oblige. Did you panic, we asked. Not really, he said. I was just trying to protect my head. Have you got anything to say to the people who rescued you? 
What would you like? Thank what you would... so much. Людям, які врятували вас, що хотіли сказати? Я їм дуже благодарен. От просто по гроб життя. Вони просто красавчики, реально роблять дуже важку і дуже потрібну роботу. Слов ні. He is a fortunate man, for the search and rescue team are needed in every single neighborhood. But when they heard Vladislav's voice, they wouldn't give up for the man and the city he lives in. John Sparks, Sky News in Kharkiv. Remarkable story. Now, Boris Johnson is set to close the Conservative Party Spring Conference while enjoying a brief reprieve from headlines on the Partygate scandal. The Prime Minister's attention likely to be focused on the UK's response to the war in Ukraine at the end of the two-day event in Blackpool. Joining us now from what I imagine to be a very, very sunny Blackpool, and indeed it is, Sky's Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. Good to see you, Sam. Uh, well, I suppose the one consequence of, uh, of Boris Johnson's strategy... Ukrainians and Russians fleeing the war are having a hard time entering the U.S. CNN's Lucy Kavanaugh talks to some asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border who've been there for days. At America's southern border, anguish and uncertainty for the war-weary. Christina was in Kyiv when Russia unleashed terror from the skies. I just wake up from bomb. She fled, first to Poland, then France, then Mexico, unable to bring her parents or brother along. They just crying so much, just hugging so much and tell goodbye, and we don't know, maybe they, they don't look each other anymore in this life. Much. Traumatized, shaken, waiting for a chance to apply for asylum in the U.S. Two, two weeks, weeks at the two border weeks. and you yeah. have not been able to cross, no. despite the fact that you're fleeing. Yeah, and or... here we are third, third time. Third time at yeah. the border. And we just try to go there. Yeah. Sergei Finik, his wife Yana, and their two little ones fled Kharkov as soon as the invasion began, before the Russians turned their home to rubble. <laughs> They said they're really hoping to be able to cross. He says he wants to go to America. An unreachable dream for many. With the U.S. southern border largely closed off to asylum seekers for the past two years, thanks to a controversial Trump-era COVID health order known as Title 42. Shortly after we spoke, Christina and other Ukrainians were allowed to cross. But they weren't the only ones seeking refuge from Vladimir Putin's wrath. There is confusion at the border here in Tijuana. We saw some Ukrainians allowed to enter, including those that have been turned away several times. This group consists of mostly Russians. They have been here for days. Their fate remains uncertain. Katya Yarina and her two children came from St. Petersburg. Her husband was arrested for protesting the invasion hours after it was announced. He feared prison or forced conscription into the war. She caught the last Aeroflot flight to Mexico, hoping to gain refuge and safe haven in the U.S. You tried to cross. What did they tell you? She says they were promised entry, then told to wait. Six days later, they remain in limbo, no access to funds because of sanctions. A Department of Homeland Security memo obtained by CNN instructs Customs and Border Protection officers to consider exempting Ukrainians from Title 42. An agency spokesman said other vulnerable individuals could be accepted on a case-by-case -case basis, but no other nationality was singled out in the new guidance. And if you'd like to help people in Ukraine who may need shelter, food, and water, please go to cnn.com slash impact, and you'll find several ways you can help. All right, coming up, mounting losses and trails of destruction. While the latest on the war in Ukraine as Russia's invasion enters its fourth week. Stay with How did Olay top expensive cream? All over the place. Why is this the best? Or part of our street fleet, which are race cars, purpose built. For shallow frying and. We're also including this. Of, of those Russian forces in Syria, do they have frontline equipment? Do they have food? Do they have fuel? Do their.
hospitalized. Sonic skin revitalizers. Why? There were over 30 intelligence experts who at the time tried to discredit uh, that the laptop as. They didn't try to just discredit the New York Post story. They also accused sitting senators, Senator Grassley and Senator Johnson, of being purveyors of Russian disinformation. And this story is not about Hunter Biden. This story is about Joe Biden. Um, this story is about the Biden family and all of their corruption. And it is about these spies who lied. They're, you know, we spent four years talking about um, election interference. And now we see we have election interference by our, our former intelligence community, election interference by big tech, election interference by um, uh, big media. All on the field of play last night in the Premier League. Leeds United took a big step towards staying up as the stoppage time goal from Luke Ayling helped them to a 3-2 win at Wolves. After history was made at Cheltenham yesterday as Rachel Blackmore became the first female rider to win the Gold Cup. Blackmore won on board the Henry de Bromhead trained Aplutard. The pair had finished second to stable mates Manila Indo... 20 miles from Arthur Bomar's residence and 30 miles to live it every day. There was a dream. UFC, yeah. He's got a whole country behind him, and when people have that, it's because you know when you look down. Ryan calling with 8 5. Oh. Shane also calling, and Faraz Chaka with King Four Hearts content to see the flop. It's a stop funding Putin's brutal war on the Ukrainian people. But now it's time for us to hone in on how we strategically use energy as a geopolitical tool and for our national security. We must use this moment to our, to our advantage to rebuild our energy systems in a way that makes us less reliant on actors attempting to subvert democracy and who to undermine or threaten our allies and our partners. This requires a three-pronged approach focused on domestic energy production, energy infrastructure, and supply chain security. This approach must include a near-term, mid-term, and long-term strategic focus work in concert with the European approach and operate in reality, including the ex existential necessity of addressing climate change. The International Energy Agency recently released a 10-point plan to cut EU dependence on Russian energy imports. This plan appears to be realistic and serious, not aspirational, and it happens to mesh well with my mantra of innovation, not elimination. We too need a realistic and reasonable plan that is responsive in the immediate term to our domestic needs and those of our allies, while being forward-thinking in the short term and the long term. The first immediate action item is to increase our domestic oil and gas production on both federal and non-federal lands. This is going to take both the administration and industry to step up to the plate, stop pointing fingers, take action, and just get it done. The administration has been pointing, a, pointing to 9,000 onshore drilling permits that have already been issued for federal leases that have not yet been drilled. What I'm told is that while this number is a little bit higher than normal, it's not extremely out of the ordinary, especially considering that 7,600 of the 9,000 of these permits have been extended past their initial two-year term by the Bureau of Land Management. A leaseholder has to apply for this drilling permit months, if not more, in advance due to the review process, and there is no guarantee that conditions will be right in the market or in the ground to drill with a given permit. With the oil prices going negative in April of 2020 and the COVID pandemic, it isn't surprising that companies asked for extensions and slowed down over the last few years. However, as I said with the leasing... Record, Lemu. Only ...or the number one way to sell your house. I've used Ideal Agent... ...or ended operations in Russia in response to its invasion of Ukraine. Several websites have sprung up to keep close tabs on which have cut ties with Moscow and which haven't. Nali Juresko is involved in some of those efforts. She served as Ukraine's finance minister from 2014 to 2016, and she joins me now from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, so in terms of the, the Western companies operating in Russia, some have pulled out, some have suspended operations. There's a big difference there. Explain why. Well, frankly speaking, the point of the boycott when we started it was to make sure that they ended, ceased their operations, severed all ties, but many companies have chosen short-term fixes like suspending, especially retailers like McDonald's, suspending operations and waiting for something better to happen instead of understanding that, in fact, this is an environment in which you cannot work. Financial losses are going to continue to grow. Reputational losses for every company will continue to grow. 
And frankly speaking, in this world where a new generation is growing up thinking about ESG principles and where do I want to work, um, what kind of company do I want to work for, these companies are putting their entire futures on the line for an environment and a percentage of profit, frankly, that really isn't that tremendously important to their bottom line. Yeah, and if they still stay there, they're, they're still paying taxes, right, that are in effect uh, supporting Russia. It's the first issue that we that we work with. We, we try to explain in all of our different websites and, and all of our efforts on the social media that they are financing the tanks that are running over civilians. They are financing with their business, with their taxes, with their, 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 their incremental support for the economy there. They're financing the bombs and the missiles that are raining on the heads of the maternity hospitals, kindergartens, orphanages, killing un unbelievable numbers of civilians. So, so there have been these uh, grassroots efforts to sort of name and shame companies that are still operating in some capacity in Russia, and you've been involved with a few of them, uh, boycottrussia.info and squeezingputin.com. So tell me uh, about the folks behind these. Who are they? What type of people? And, and why did you decide to get involved? Well, I was sitting on the couch with my daughter on the 23rd of the evening here, early in the morning, the 24th in Ukraine, when the bombs started hitting. And all I could think about was that, what could we do? What could we as individuals do um, to help stop the war? And I, and I started to think about this ESG principles. I wrote an op-ed in the FT saying every company needs to stop. Um, there's no way that anyone can morally continue to finance an economy that has started an unprovoked war like that. And that led to working with colleagues of mine in London at Highgate, a firm that I had worked with before colleagues, and they developed boycott.com boycottrussia.info, which really focuses on top companies and, and, and tries to get everyone to look at the companies that are the largest. And then volunteers started pouring in and uh, squeezingputin.com appeared because of some volunteers who were keeping track of each and every company operating in Russia, what they were saying, what they were really doing to be able to parse through all of the announcements, which are not always clear. Um, and then they added recently what humanitarian efforts each of the companies are making to help Ukrainians. I, I guess it's hard to, to get sort of uh, measurables here, but what effect do you think this is having? Well, I think that for average Russians, the departure of the retailers is important. They're seeing, you know, shut down McDonald's, shut down Estee Lauder uh, retailers, and they're seeing certain products uh, disappearing from there from stock. I think what's really important initially was the divestment of BP, Shell, uh, Exxon from the energy sector. But right now what we're waiting for is the financial sector, which is at the very heart of the operations. So Citi, ING, Raiffeisen Bank, Barclays Bank, Unicredit, they all continue to finance both the companies that are remaining there, but as well the Russian economy. And so companies like Citi, which represent America globally, really need to take the time right now and make the right decision, both financially for their company, but morally for the entire globe and all their customers and clients and shareholders. I want to ask you this because of your unique experience. I mean, you were you were finance minister, I understand, after the annexation of Crimea. Um, what, you know, seeing Putin celebrating the, the anniversary of the, the annexation with a huge concert and, and so on. I mean, what, what did that feel like for you? Well, it reminds me of pictures of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And we saw the stories on TV of many of the people being bused there forcibly, but then many others being there voluntarily. And what, what, what it tells us is that he does have an enormous amount of support amongst his own people. The stories, the disinformation that's filled the airwaves in Russia over the last 20 years has been extremely detrimental to anyone's understanding of what's going on in, in, in Ukraine. And the combination of his own disinformation and then shutting off all access to the outside world, to social media, to, to free press, kicking out the free press, um, you know, a history of murdering uh, journalists who have a voice and have, have, have delivered news that Putin didn't like, has created an environment in Russia where uh, individuals just don't understand uh, that there are no Nazis in Ukraine, that Ukraine was attacked unprovoked. No one was planning anything. No one had any intention uh, to, to harm uh, Russians, Russian speakers, or Russia. So I think you know, this proves the ability of autocrats uh, to feed disinformation to their populations and, and basically um, 
eliminate any possibility for real decision making. Yeah, we, we only have a, a few seconds left, but I just want to ask you, because you were involved in rebuilding Ukraine's uh, economy after that, I mean, looking at the situation now, how big of a task will that be even after this, this war is eventually over, going forward to, to rebuild yet again? Ukraine will prevail. You can see from the fierceness of our defenders and the, and the attitude of the people, they will not give up their existence. This is a war of exist for, for our own existence. But the building is going to be unbelievably difficult. It's hundreds of billions of dollars. All the airports, the roads, the schools, the ports have been destroyed. This is going to be nothing less, if not possibly more, than the Marshall Plan itself. This is going to require all of the, 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 the frozen assets of the Russian entities to be turned over to Ukraine for reparations. Russia is going to have to pay with um, the frozen assets and others for the damage it's done, and we're going to have to raise international support from all sides. Yeah, a, a huge challenge ahead, as you say. I uh, really appreciate your time. Natalie Jaresko, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Kim. Coming up, a stern warning to China not to bail Vladimir Putin out. We'll explain what Joe Biden told Xi Jinping in their video call Friday. That story is coming up on CNN Newsroom. Please stay with us. It's behind Nariva Plus. Unlike ordinary time of it, in practice, it, it, it looked like others his rivals were much more comfortable. Tell us what you expect to see this weekend. You know, why are Mercedes struggling so much with this new car? Well, we don't want to give the game away just yet uh, because we're going to be talking about that before we go live uh, um, before the uh, FB3 and then qualifying. But there could be a few surprises at this race. Uh, that's the feeling. Um, maybe the biggest, uh, the, 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 the least surprising thing is that Red Bull may be competitive. Um, Ferrari look good. Behind that, we really don't know. It's, a, it's going to be a big scrap. And Mercedes will, may well find themselves in the, in the midfield. They may well do from what from what we saw yesterday. Uh, Damon Hill, thank you very much. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend and thanks for your time this morning. Okay. Thank you. Jackie, thank you. Now, as Russia praised its operation in Ukraine and the heroic effort of his troops, Sky News witnessed civilians being hit from the ground and the air near to Kiev. Six buildings, including a preschool were damaged in the attack on the city's Podol neighbourhood, just north of the city centre and around one and a half miles from the government quarter holding the presidential palace. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, reports. This is what the Russian authorities insist is not happening. The Russian leader is adamant his military is not hitting homes in the Ukrainian capital or elsewhere because attacking civilians is an international war crime and President Putin insists he's doing everything he can to preserve the lives of civilians. That's in direct contradiction to the evidence we and many others are finding on the ground. In the center is a playground. Around it are residential blocks, people's homes, schools. They've been pretty much reduced to rubble. And these are some of those who used to live in them. They've lost everything. It's not human to do this, she says. To attack the children. I didn't remember words in they grab whatever they can in plastic bags. Pets, TVs, this is all they have now. Right next door, there are two schools. One is a kindergarten. Schools have been suspended for the time being in the capital, or these classrooms would have been full of pupils. These attacks are killing, and they're not soldiers or fighters. This was an elderly man, one of many who felt too frail to leave the city despite the dangers. The daily attacks have left others badly hurt. He survived with terrible head wounds. His wife did not. The victims here don't have much faith in any peace talk succeeding, and no one we spoke to had any doubt about who the attacks are aimed at. And you think it was specifically targeted at civilians like you? Why, though? Da, 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 da. Yes, yes, I definitely think this, she says. Putin's trying to kill as many Ukrainians as he can. 
And the Kiev mayor is absolutely certain these repeated attacks on civilians are ruthlessly executed. Do you think there's any mistake? This could have been a mistake, or was this deliberately targeting civilians? Uh, OK, if we're talking about mistake, here's mistake. Last uh, morning was a mistake, 24 hours ago. Two days ago was a mistake, huge mistake, destroyed the Kharkiv and Mariupol. How many mistakes they do it? How many civilians have to kill? And after that to explain about mistake uh, from, from Russian forces. The UN's warned the country's food supply system is falling apart. They were scrambling to save stocks here. A number of these shops have been hit as well and impacted, and that is the worry that a lot of these Food supply chains, bakeries, food factories have all been impacted as well and are being specifically targeted. So they're wasting no time pooling supplies in Kyiv. These are all donations. They're trying to make sure those left homeless and hungry by the bombings are somehow looked after. And this despite worries that food warehouses in the country are running low. Those who have are giving to those who don't. I think the, uh, that we are the second front on this country because the army is the first front, volunteers and eat for the second front. This is true community. Whilst the capital may so far have been spared a major assault, among the workers here there are those who've also lost their homes to the daily bombings. Like Tatiana, back two days later helping those she feels are less fortunate. You know, it's strange, it's like uh, something unbelievable. It's like from the movie, something from the movie came in my real life. She showed us her flat, now in bits. She's moved in with friends. For me, I don't think that I can die or something like this. I am afraid. I, f I think uh, what I can do for other people and you know, something like this. What, how I can help. Yeah. No, because I, I'm lucky and in my building about 400 apartments and everybody alive. And other, oh no, other people not so lucky. Mm. The suffering is unrelenting. And whilst Kyiv defences are so far holding, the capital's residents are still bracing themselves for more of this and worse. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Kyiv. Time for a quick look, see how the weather is. I think both of the countries understand that they have um, essentially a de facto alliance because they are they're both have an interest in undermining the U.S.-led order, both in Europe and in Asia. Um, and, the, and the CCP, you know, they, con they haven't said that they're directly helping Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but they did give the green light about when Putin could invade Ukraine after the Olympics. They did share intelligence with the Russians about what the United States knew about the invasion. And Senator Marco Rubio is the ranking Republican on the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he said that he knows for certain that Xi is lying about not assisting um, Russia in, in this invasion of, of Ukraine. So they are complicit. Now what this the Biden administration needs to do is understand it and not continue to stick their head in the sand and think that they can convince Xi by kind of shaming them and saying, hey, are you going to be on the right side of history? You know, the Chinese Communist Party wants to write those history books themselves. They want to dominate. They want to push the United States out. So we need to have a clear-eyed vision of, yeah. of, the two, of the two countries and how they're collaborating. Boy, are you right. Yeah, Xi Jinping warning that more sanctions on Russia could lead to a serious uh, global food supply crisis. So he's, he's giving us the warning already. Uh, Rebecca, great insight. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks so much. Okay. Pete? So well said by Rebecca. They want to write the history books mm -hmm. themselves if they can. Thanks, Rachel. All right, turning now to some additional headlines. A 14-year-old is gunned down in a shopping mall in Kansas. Wichita police say they arrested two teenagers suspected of opening fire on the victim after some sort of fight inside the mall. Fears of an active shooting sending panic shoppers running for cover. No one else was hurt. Police believe the shooting may be gang-related. And lawyers for disgraced actor Jesse Smollett are now filing a complaint against a lawsuit filed by the two brothers who claimed they participated.
How did Olay top expensive creams like this with hydration that beats the one? together all the facts that actually came to that culminating moment in the history of Afghanistan. So a long answer to your question, uh, it's a great question, and uh, I'm going to continue to think about it, and I know others will as well. Thank you. Courtney. Hi, General McKenzie. I, I want to echo the thanks for talking to us, especially on the hard days, and also add to it thank you to your, um, your PAO, Bill Urban, who's also been very accessible and helpful to us during your time. I know you guys are very busy, but you, you both always made time for us. Uh, I, uh, two quick questions. One following on what Sylvie was asking about the missile defense systems, because you talked about the importance of those in your opening statement. I'm wondering if you have any concerns about losing any of those systems, given the, the, you know, the ongoing need for them in places like UCOM in Ukraine, or if you think that you have enough. I know you, you, you frequently say that you never have enough of anything, but do you feel like you actually need more missile defense systems in CENTCOM? And then also, there's been a lot of talk about delisting the IR RGC as a foreign terror organization as part of these negotiations um, with the, the peace talks. And I'm wondering if you can talk about sort of the operational impact, if there is one, that that could have on the theater if the IRGC is no longer an FTL. Hey, hey, thanks, Courtney. First, on air defense systems, let me say we have enough for, for, for the mission that we've been given here in Central Command right now. So, and the Secretary and I are in a constant dialogue through the Chairman about what the appropriate posture is here in, in Central Command. I think the, the, real, the real story about air defenses in CENTCOM is not, US, not the U.S. air defenses. It's really the air defenses and particularly the, the Patriot systems and other high-end systems that our Gulf and other partners possess and how that is knitted together. Because it's, it's what you, what you got to do is Saudi Arabia has a number of Patriot batteries, UAE has a number of Patriot batteries, as does Kuwait, as does Bahrain. So. What the, the task in the theater is really how do you knit those together so that you create more than the simple sum of the component parts. We call that you know tipping and queuing, advance early warning, and you build what what we know. And you've heard me say this: the common operational picture. So everybody sees the same thing. Everybody gets early warning. Everybody can be prepared to react very quickly to a potential Iranian attack. That's where. Uh, that's where the future in this theater is. And so why is it important now? And why are we suddenly at a state where uh, it looks like people are increasingly interested in it? I'll tell you, it's principally because of the Iranians. They have invested uh, enormous resources into improving the number and capabilities of their ballistic missiles. And, you know, it, it was in the Al-Assad attack in January of 2020, their missiles hit within tens of meters of the targets they were intended to hit. So we, you have to respect that capability. And believe me, our partners in the Gulf respect that capability. So nothing focuses the mind, you know, of a nation like an imminent threat just over the horizon with malign intent. So it's not only ballistic missiles, it's also land attack cruise missiles, and it's also uh, unmanned aerial systems. All of those things are now at a greater state of danger than we have ever seen in the Central Command AOR. So, you know, so now there's, there's pressure that really is immediate, that maybe hasn't been there in the years prior for nations to come together and develop that defense architecture that will allow them to share information. And again, it is a, uh, it's a form of defense cooperation that's, that's easier to get to than other forms of defense cooperation, because as I've noted, you're really sharing information. And so, so when we think about what's in the theater, what do we need, that's really the heart of the matter. It is not the U.S. systems. It is actually our allied and partner nation, uh, nation systems, and they have a bunch more Patriot batteries than we do in the theater by a factor of three or four or five. So there's a lot of capability there. Courtney, you asked about the, the IRGC, and, uh, you know, First, I would tell you, the IRGC is, uh, is, is, is the centerpiece of Iranian bad behavior in the, in the theater. The IRGC and the elite sub-element of the IRGC, the Quds Force, you know, they're the principal malign actor in the theater, so they're very concerning to me. Uh, as to whether, what the effect delisting them would have, you know, I really, I, I don't know that. I, I, am, I just, I would defer to the Department of State. I don't know that in, in terms of operationally, in terms of the way we think about them, in the terms of the way we think about the threat and what they do on a daily basis across the theater, I don't think much would change as a result of that. But, but again, I would wait to see what, you know, what the actual agreement is, what actually the parties contract to undertake as a result of that. And thanks, Courtney. You have time. Realize their own dreams. The commemorative Air Force honors the hero. We have baby foods. 
uh, we have essentials um, uh, and also uh, just, you know, um, other foods like canned food, uh, pasta, rice, things like that. But we were pretty much working on the on the list that we were given, trying to give the, the needed things um, because a lot of people have been donating clothes and um, at the moment that's, um, that, that's not needed. Um, is is um, yeah, it's baby food and 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 women, women's products is is what, what uh, we have been asked for, and we have two van loads of of, of that uh, with us at the moment. That's we that we take into the Polish border. Yeah, that 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 is brilliant. Well done, you, Taras. Do, do you anticipate any problems in in getting to the border? I mean, I'd suggest you might want to keep an eye on your rear view mirror. Also, driving a van all the way to the border today, at the former Prime Minister David Cameron. So you don't want to get, let him get in front of you. Oh no, no. <laughs> we had the. Uh, uh, just about half an hour ago before uh, before the interview, uh, on the way to the service station, our uh, engine management light came on, which was a, a great surprise. So now we're thinking, do we go to, a ser uh, to the services to get that checked out, or do we just take a chance and, <laughs> and hopefully make it to the border without breaking down? <laughs> If you're anything like my ex-girlfriend, you'll leave it for five years until the car cat packs in. Um, but let's focus again, though, Taras. What, what, what prompted you to, to, to help in all of this? I think some people may, may have picked up a hint with your mum being called to Olga and with your son name that there might be a, a very personal connection. Um, well, yeah, we have uh, all of my family, uh, you know, all my grandparents are still alive. Some of them in the 70s and 80s, they, they're still um, alive, so they... Um, uh, they are in Sumy, which is on the border uh, with Russia. So there, there, there's heavy fighting going on there, uh, and uh, Sumy became quite infamous with the with the amount of resistance they have uh, uh, they have put up with. And um, uh, obviously, um, lots of friends, and uh, even my dad is, is 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 still there. And uh, I think for the first three days, when I found out that this is happening. Um, I couldn't um, think or do anything. I was just so stressed and anxious about what was going on. And I think uh, I decided to do something and help the people, but also help myself deal with that stress. And I think uh, concentrating on, on getting uh, help to Ukraine has helped me a great deal to, to deal with that stress. And... Uh, it's um, it's 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 a, you know you're helping people, but you're also helping yourself uh, to overcome this because I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with with thoughts. I was so angry, and I decided to put that strength, that energy into something like um, helping uh, helping Ukraine uh, in what I could. Um, well, I have to say it's an incredibly constructive and incredibly positive thing that you have done. I just wonder, just one final thought from you, Taras. Of course, your family is there. They will remember, you know, very well when Ukraine was the Ukraine and was, was part of the Soviet Union, how they feel and how you feel about the actions taken by the Russians against Ukraine. What do you think of the man, Putin? Um, well, to say that I'm surprised that this has happened, I'm I'm not that surprised because we've we have been expecting this for for some time, and uh, we, you know, a lot of people thinking how can this happen? Uh, this is unthinkable. Well, we we thought that that what happened in 2014 was unthinkable, and that has happened. So. Uh, you can expect anything from Putin. I, I think he's... Karas, I'm uh, so sorry. We have literally 10 seconds left in the programme and I need to say well done you. Drive safely and I'll pop in and say hello to your mum next time I'm back home. Look after yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Selling a home. Game so bad, even ex-Obama advisors now warning the White House, you can't blame everything on Putin. We break down the truth next. I recommend Nature Made Vitamins because I.
It's my 405. The show must go on. Migraine medicine. It's other huge problems, but the headquarters as a whole as a joint war fighting four star headquarters focused on the Iranian problem and everything attended to that. Thanks, Nick. Okay, with that, we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, sir. Uh, it has been an honor working with you and your public affairs team there at CENTCOM. Uh, do you have any closing remarks for us here? Sure, I'd just like to say that I actually, I think reaching out and being available to the press and talking to the press is a very important responsibility for all senior leaders. We got to do it. And there have been days, I'll tell you, I would rather have my leg taken off below the knee than come in there and talk to you guys. And, uh, but, I, but it was an important thing to do. And in the long run, it's better for the country. It's better for everyone if we're accessible to you and we share what information we've got. And I have enjoyed the very professional, uh, professionally rewarding and personally re rewarding relationships that I've had with members of the media. Uh, you're, you're trying to do your job, and your job is very important, and I, and I, and I support it. Thanks, for, thanks very much. It's been a good uh, opportunity to talk to you today. I wish you all the best, and uh, thanks very much. Out from Tampa. All right. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's press briefing. Thank you. and tiredness. Learn it's a fact. Dangerous than others. But collaboration that occurs in the classroom of this week's tornadoes and then it was global they were just a vessel of God's grace to us it was it was amazing like other survivors of the tornado that flood of goodwill has helped her get by I know that I am far more in a deeper walk with my faith than I was before the tornado God has just shown himself over and over and over again Severe storms take aim and are ready to strike in the northeast. Ah, look at that. Wow, we're going to pinpoint where and when. But that's not the only region in the bullseye. Where else we could see some tornadoes top up, pile up later this afternoon. <laughs> are just no good. Coming up, who's seeing a spike in pollen right now and ways to get some relief with some home remedies. Plus, the Atlanta Science Festival is happening this weekend, and there are more than 100 days in which to revise and extend their remarks. You posted on that. As for the hypersonic missile claims from Russia, it is important to point out those are only coming at this point from the Russian Defense Ministry. It may be true that they are using hypersonic missiles. It may be just another propaganda tactic to further pressure and frighten Ukrainian civilians. They have certainly been frightening them once again in Kyiv, where artillery shelling from the Russian tanks on the outskirts of the capital city has again done damage. Civilian targets have been hit. As you know, all week what you're seeing there is an attack from Friday. In the eastern city of Kharkiv, too, there has been constant bombardment from Russian forces who clearly are intent on taking that strategic 
strategically important city. But Ukrainians continue to fight back, fight for every inch of this country. Uh, there, we have seen pictures of Russian tanks, which Ukrainians say their forces once again destroyed as they sit in positions not just around the capital, Kiev, but around other cities too. We're also seeing some interesting satellite uh, images from Maxar Technologies, which show the huge lines of people trying to escape various cities, in particular the hard-pressed southern city of Mariupol. That line of vehicles are full of refugees just trying to get away from the fighting. And in the midst of all of this, President Zelensky of Ukraine says it is time for Russian President Vladimir Putin to sit down and talk and find a way to get a peace deal. Listen here to President Zelensky. Thanks to the courage and professional training of the Ukrainian armed forces, the occupation forces were stopped in almost all directions. It's time to meet, time to talk. It is time to restore territorial integrity and justice for Ukraine. Now, as you know, guys, uh, Defense Secretary Austin is currently in Bulgaria on part of his tour of Eastern European countries. I want to bring you these pictures of a protest uh, outside his meeting there. Uh, we are told by our producers on the ground that the protesters are concerned that the, the U.S. Defense Secretary's presence there could lead to Bulgaria being dragged into this conflict. Obviously, uh, a few hundred protesters is not a large group by any means, but it does speak to the growing nervousness among many Eastern European nations that they could be pulled into this conflict. Something Vladimir Putin, frankly, uh, sitting in Moscow or wherever he is today, uh, might be quite glad to see. There's nothing he would like more than to make all of Eastern Europe very nervous indeed. Lawrence, Rachel, Pete. Jonathan, great report. Real quick follow-up question we had in the previous hour. The bombardment that we're seeing in the West, closer to where you are in Lviv, is that targeting military shipments, attempts at resupply, um, we, or, or is it indiscriminate like we're seeing in the East? Are they trying to cut off weapons coming in? What are they doing? Yeah, it appears to be very targeted, Pete. It's a very good question. But yes, at the moment, it, we just had the one strike yesterday on an airport facility. It was an aircraft repair facility. The Russians said it was being used by the Ukrainian Air Force to repair MiGs. The Ukrainians said there was no activity there at all. And then, obviously, uh, last weekend, we saw the attack on the Yavariv military base about 30 miles outside of Lviv. That again, a military target. The Russians said they were taking out foreign fighters who were gathering there. So, yes, at the moment, it is what the Russians consider military targets. But I can tell you, Pete, it has made everybody here in Lviv very well aware that the Russians have the ability to hit anywhere in Ukraine at any time. And they have shown, of course, they are perfectly willing to hit civilian targets everywhere. Pete? That's exactly right. Jonathan Hunt, thank you very much for the opportunity. Missile struck a government building, but a phone call suggested there was a survivor in the rubble. Our correspondent John Sparks watched the rescuers ignore air raid sirens to try to find one man. The city of Kharkiv looks battered and bruised. Every street in every neighborhood has been touched by war, but there are some districts here that have going to Poland, going somewhere else uh, in Europe, especially where they may not know people, learn a new language, a new culture is pretty daunting for a lot of people. So many of the people that I spoke to yesterday about their safety level say that they intend to stay as long as they possibly can. Kristen, Boris. Scott, the U.N. estimating that some six and a half million people are displaced within the country of Ukraine. Obviously, they will start to flee westward, as you noted when things get heated in the east. Scott McLean from Lviv, Ukraine, thank you so much. Let's pivot now to the White House and President Biden this week taking a direct step to warn a global player to stay out of this conflict. He told President Xi Jinping of China there would be serious consequences if China helps Russia in Ukraine. CNN White House reporter Jasmine Wright is traveling with the president in Delaware. Jasmine, bring us up to speed on that conversation between Xi and Biden. 
Well, Boris, U.S. officials said that President Biden was direct when he described both the implications and consequences for China should it aid Russia in this ongoing offensive. But one thing that remains unclear here, Boris, is whether or not President Biden achieved at least part of the goal, which was to influence China's President Xi into choosing the right path here. And so administration officials from the U.S. they described the nearly two-hour-long call as substantive, detailed, and direct. And now. Our own Caitlin Collins yesterday in a briefing with White House press secretary, she answered, she asked really a pivotal question here when it comes to ascertaining whether or not the U.S. feels successful, which is whether or not it still has concerns that Russia, uh, excuse me, that China may come to Russia's aid either military or financially in this ongoing conflict. Take a listen here. Yesterday, Secretary Blinken said the administration was concerned that China is considering answering Russia's request for more military equipment. After this two-hour call, does the White House still have that concern? We have that concern. The president detailed, um, uh, you know, what the implications and consequences would be if China provides material support to Russia um, as it conducts brutal attacks against Ukrainian cities and civilians. And obviously, that is something we will be watching and the world will be watching. So that concern hasn't gone away following the call? Obviously, actions are a key part of what we'll be watching. Now, there we just heard from Saki saying their actions will be a key part of what they're actually, what they're watching, laying out an overview. Now, something that Saki did not say was that she did not get into specifically what the U.S. could have prepared for China should it do what it fears that it might, which is aid Russia militarily or financially. Neither did senior administration officials who briefed reporters after President Xi and Biden's call. Um, but one thing coming from President Xi's side, according to state media, is that he said that it was up to both sides, both the U.S and China to ensure peace around the globe, kind of a vague description about where things lie. But again, really no word on the reality of exactly where President Xi stands in terms of this conflict, something that was pivotal to Biden to try to assess as, as there really is no real no mark of where they're at. And of course, this call, Boris, comes at an incredibly pivotal time where U.S. officials feel that China could have real influence when it comes to the trajectory of this ongoing conflict and, of course, any decision that China makes uh, would really uh, potentially have grave implications for U.S. and China relations for decades to come. Boris? Jasmine Wright, live in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware for us. Jasmine, thank you. And so next week, President Biden is going to travel to Europe to meet with world leaders to discuss Russia's invasion of Ukraine and to participate in a NATO summit. CNN's Natasha Bertrand is live from Russia's. And Natasha, I mean, this has to be one of the most high stakes foreign trips of Biden's presidency. Absolutely, Kristen. It will be a very, very closely watched trip. They are not necessarily <laughs> anticipating any major deliverables to actually come out of this summit next week because, of course, NATO has said that it is not going to enter the war in Ukraine, that they are not going to put NATO forces on the ground or in the air to defend Ukraine against this Russian onslaught. But it will be a chance for President Biden to show the world that the West is still very unified in defense of Ukraine against Russia's attack there. Now, he's expected to meet with NATO leaders on Thursday. Day, and they will discuss deterrence and defense measures uh, with regard to the war in Ukraine. Deterrence being how can we prevent Russia from escalating even further? And importantly, how can we prevent Russia from going further and further west towards Poland, towards that NATO doorstep? Now, the defense, of course, how can we shore up these eastern flank allies who are feeling very, very vulnerable and threatened right now by Putin's aggression in Ukraine? As you mentioned at the top of the hour, Russia has launched attacks uh, roughly 10 miles from Poland's border. So obviously the conflict is getting closer and closer to that doorstep there. And they are essentially on the front lines of this conflict if it does come uh, further west. So that will be the main priority of those conversations. And then with EU leaders, when he meets with them on Thursday, they will also be discussing the state of the conflict and, of course, uh, arms assistance to Ukraine, those, those weapons deliveries that Zelensky has been asking for uh, over the last several weeks and months. So a lot on the agenda here, of course. It will be a very closely watched engagement. Kristen? No question about that. Natasha Bertrand, live from EU headquarters in Brussels. Thank you so much. The U.S. Defense Secretary tells CNN that Russia has made a number of missteps in its invasion of Ukraine. And the assessment comes as the Pentagon chief was in Bulgaria meeting with U.S. and NATO troops ahead of the president's visit to Brussels next week. Yeah, our colleague Don Lemon sat down for an exclusive interview with Secretary Lloyd Austin. 
Here's a portion of it. What is your assessment of, of Russian forces now? Are they stalled? Are they regrouping so that they can increase uh, their assault or increase their violence on Ukraine? What's your assessment of the Russian military? Well, it's hard to tell, Don. I think, uh, you know, they, they have not progressed as, far, as quickly as they would have liked to. Uh, they, I think they envisioned that they would move rapidly and very quickly uh, seize uh, uh, the capital city. They've not been able to do that. Uh, they've struggled with uh, uh, logistics, so we've seen a number of missteps uh, along the way. I don't see, uh, um, you know, evidence of good employment of uh, tactical uh, intelligence. I don't see integration of, uh, uh, you know, uh, air capability with the ground uh, ground maneuver. And so there are a number of things that we would expect to have seen that, that we just haven't seen. And the Russians really have had some, that's presented them some problems. So. Many of their assumptions uh, have not uh, have not proven to be true as they as they entered this fight. Let's get some more expert analysis now. CNN military analyst and retired Air Force Colonel Cedric Layton is with us, and the president of the Global Situation Room, Brett Bruin, also join us. He was the director of global engagement in the Obama administration. Uh, Colonel, let's start with that assessment from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Uh, it coincides with British intelligence saying that. Uh, the Kremlin was caught off guard by the scale and ferocity of Ukrainian resistance, and that leads to the belief that the strategy will shift for the Russians. They're going to look at a, a war of attrition now, essentially winning by any means necessary. What does that look like on the ground in Ukraine? Well, Boris, good morning. It, uh, th that is going to be one of the most terrible developments of this war, frankly. I, you know, I think the, you know, as the Secretary of Defense mentioned in the British Intelligence Assessment, uh, also pointed to, uh, it's very clear that the Russians wanted to do something like they did back in 1968 in taking over Czechoslovakia. They basically did it in two days when they uh, when they came in and uh, 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 replaced the communist government uh, of uh, Ducek in, in that country. Uh, you know, when it comes to Ukraine, we are going to see the pounding of cities. We're going to see uh, the use of artillery, the use of indiscriminate airstrikes. Uh, we're going to see some more cruise missiles being uh, lobbed into the country from various locations. Uh, and that is going to, I think, really point to the fact that this war is going to enter a new and unfortunately brutal, more brutal phase. And Brett, let's dissect the idea of an off-ramp for Vladimir Putin. Uh, this morning, uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine warned that Russia's losses would be so huge that several generations would not be able to, to rebound. Um, at this point, though, it doesn't appear that Vladimir Putin is eager for an off-ramp. It seems like he is moving toward, as the colonel pointed out, a, a strategy of more bloodshed. It does not. And one of the things I think we have to be aware of and on the lookout for is Putin, if he is going to drag this conflict out, will also try to sow uh, divisions and to deplete the, uh, the unity of uh, the West and the NATO alliance. So uh, we also should be looking out for Putin's efforts, uh, potentially even to open a, a second front in this conflict. It could be in a place like uh, Georgia or Moldova, where Russia already has similar separatist regions. Uh, and the question then becomes, will uh, NATO, will the West uh, stand up with the same level of support that we've seen in Ukraine? Uh, Putin is a master of uh, the, the art of distraction. And I think we have to be conscious of that and we have to be ready to respond. Uh, Russia and Belarus have sent uh, tacit signals about Moldova specifically. It's notable that you mentioned that. Uh, Colonel, back to you. Uh, the latest from Ukraine, there are reports that indicate that dozens of Ukrainian troops were killed in a strike in Mykolaiv. That's in the southern part of the country, uh, somewhere between Odessa and, and Mariupol. Uh, you've talked extensively about the significance of the Black Sea uh, as a strategic point for getting supplies into Ukraine. Uh, help us understand that the focus of the Russian military going into this part, the southern part of Ukraine. Why does it matter so much? Yeah, Boris, the, the southern part of Ukraine is key because once the southern part is taken over, that's basically the coastline. Uh, so on the Black Sea and on the Sea of Azov, 
those areas, if they are taken over by the Russians completely, uh, what that means is, is it cuts off any access that uh, Ukraine has to the sea. Uh, and it hurts their exports, hurts their ability to get resupplied from a military standpoint, uh, and it makes it far more difficult for Ukraine to be a viable country uh, if that area is taken over. Uh, so the event in Mykolaiv is one in which uh, they are really using a strategy of encirclement and uh, decimation as it goes forward. And what they're going to be doing is, uh, you know, further movement toward the west from that area toward Odessa. And the, the idea there, because Odessa is the major port, is to cut everything off and uh, go all the way to the Romanian border. And Brett, uh, we talked a little bit this morning about the phone call between President Biden and President Xi of China. Uh, from an incentives perspective, China benefits from playing both sides, g giving very uh, sort of light criticism of the invasion while simultaneously uh, not really going after and, and condemning Vladimir Putin. In fact, securing uh, recently a, a deal for oil that lasts 30 years and boasting of this eternal partnership between these two nations. Uh, what do you expect the United States to do to try to deter Xi Jinping from getting involved in this conflict by supplying Russia either with military aid or, or financial relief from sanctions? Well, clearly, uh, China represents a potential lifeline, perhaps uh, the most significant potential lifeline for Moscow. And so what you're seeing from the White House are efforts to signal to Beijing that there will be economic uh, consequences if they choose to provide that direct support. Now, this is one of those points, though, Boris, where I think it will be a challenge for the administration to try and bring along some of our other allies with this, and it will be a test of American diplomacy if uh, we are able to rally the world, not only against Russia, but uh, should China come to the aid of Putin, will we uh, be united similarly in our response? I think China currently is trying, as you said, to sit on the fence and on the one hand uh, to inflict some damage on uh, the West and on international order, while on the other hand, certainly trying to um, benefit from uh, its position that suggests that uh, China deplores the, the violence, deplores the situation in Ukraine, but is not going to do anything uh, to uh, come to the aid of the Ukrainians or bring the conflict to a quick end. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how some of these European allies that have forged very close ties with China economically might respond uh, if she, in fact, provides Russia with weapons in Ukraine. Uh, Colonel Cedric Layton, Brett Bruin, we got to leave the conversation there. Appreciate you getting up early for us this morning. Thank you, Brett. Four U.S. soldiers are dead after a U.S. military aircraft appears to have crashed during NATO training exercises in Norway. That's according to Norway's prime minister. Uh, the Osprey aircraft was spotted on Friday by a rescue helicopter after what authorities called a mishap uh, that uh, caused, quote, major damage. We will continue to bring you updates, of course, as we get them. Meanwhile, more than three million people have fled Ukraine since Russia's invasion began. Coming up, how one group is working to resettle refugees here in the United States. Plus, new details in the death of American James Hill, who was killed in Ukraine this week. His chilling account detailing the deteriorating situation in Ukraine before his death. Up next. Plus, remember the COVID pandemic? It's not gone. Moderna seeking authorization now for a second COVID-19 booster, as doctors are warning that a new variant is emerging overseas that could wind up in the U.S. over the next few weeks. Stay with us. We'll be right back. to a sedentary lives of the party Shackleton and vibe and now and fans that can add a nice Liberty Mutual customizes your particularly in Western Ukraine spring is the season of new life and new beginnings and for farmers the world over it has always been a type of a time of hope as they sow their seeds for the crop ahead full of optimism for what it might bring in the future. And in Ukraine today, the determination to get this year's crop in the ground 
shows that the Ukraine is a country that believes in its future and that refuses to give up. Of course, Ukraine is a significant global producer of many agricultural commodities, such as wheat and sunflower oil. And the invasion of Ukraine has obviously caused turbulence in international commodity markets. Agricultural commodity prices have always been closely correlated with the price of energy. The turbulence on the market has brought into focus once again the crucial importance of a resilient global supply chain. So last week, I attended a special meeting of the G7 to discuss the international security situation in respect of food. And at difficult times, when there is a shock to the market, the single most important thing that the rest of the world can do is to keep markets open. There is over 200 million tons of wheat in store around the world. And those who operate the market need to be able to move stocks around freely in order to satisfy global demand. Now, the UK is largely self-sufficient in wheat production and imports just a small amount, predominantly from Canada. But we are working with like-minded countries around the world to ensure that trade flows continue. And we are also working through organizations like the World Food Programme to identify vulnerabilities where they exist and to ensure that we play our part in ensuring that those nations in need, including those besieged cities in Ukraine, receive the food that they need. Within my own department, we have also received many offers of help from farmers. We listen to your goals and help you achieve them with care and coverage. Really need to get things done or will they look perhaps at just extending the current bill? You know, the nice thing, this is the election year, right? 2022 is the election year. Sometimes those years fall of an expiration during election year, and it is always hard to pass anything in an election year. So I think by the fact that it is 2023, we may have a greater chance of getting it passed on time. I think that's a lot of people's hope and goal, because if you do roll it into 2024, if you have just a one-year extension, all of a sudden you're into a presidential election. And so you are into a lot more, um, you know, just problems getting that consensus that this is a bipartisan vote. It's always been a bipartisan vote. You get both members from both sides and everybody at, eats food. You have rural districts from all, every blue state and red state. And, and so that's kind of a hope anyway that 2023 would be when we would likely see something unless it's a longer term extension. I don't think you'd get a one year extension in 2023. At times of the past. Help bring back a quality. So much is out of your hands. Nazism. Joining us now is former CIA station chief who served in Moscow and Fox News contributor Dan Hoffman. Dan, thanks for being here. Uh, a big stage propaganda event. We even saw the new symbol of this invasion, that Z that's painted on the tanks, put on flags. Is he, are the Russian people buying this writ large? We hear reports, but is th was this meant for an internal audience or an external audience? Yeah, so I think it's meant for an internal audience, uh, and I think it's meant actually for Vladimir Putin's inner circle. You know, those are the ones he fears the most. He knows that he made some gross miscalculations about the war. Uh, and let's make no mistake, it's a war, even if Putin wants to call it a special military sure. operation. Uh, he, he miscalculated on Russia's military, which is bogged down. He miscalculated on the will uh, and the capacity of Ukraine to fight. And, he, and most of all, on President Zelensky, who mobilized the West. He's the one, Zelensky, who wakened us all, uh, Western nations, uh, out of their post-Cold War slumber and, and enabled us to crater the Russian economy. You know, Zelensky has a whole lot of allies, including Switzerland, Finland, uh, Norway, Sweden, countries that have traditionally been neutral, whereas Putin has no allies whatsoever, in spite of this Potemkin village uh, effort to try to dis demonstrate, you know, that, that, that there's support behind Russia's war effort. Putin's a KGB officer. He's a purveyor of lies, uh, disinformation, and propaganda. That's what was on display yesterday. Dan, there are... Increasing reports of Russian troops captured or otherwise 
uh, saying, you know, a, a lot of the troops we're serving with don't believe in this mission or feel like they were lied to and would rather not be there. What do you make of these reports? Are, are, are they as big as are we overinflating this and most of the Russian military is there in the fight? I, I think those reports are certainly accurate. It's very hard to measure the morale of Russia's uh, fighting force, but keep in mind that there's a lot of Russian dead soldiers, and, and those numbers are, it's very hard to know exactly how many aren't, aren't ever going to be going home. Uh, but there's enough that we're seeing protests uh, in, in Vladimir Putin's hometown of St. Petersburg. And the longer this goes on, uh, it just makes it more clear that the war is not going according to plan, as Putin said it would. That, and that the concern for us is that Russia, uh, that Putin is going to be taking more risks. He's been launching missiles increasingly at civilian targets. We saw the attack on the drama yeah. theater in Mariupol and, of course, the maternity ward as well. Well, our Secretary of State has said much the same. Here's Anthony Blinken on what Russia may be plotting. Listen. We believe that Moscow may be setting the stage to use a chemical weapon and then falsely blame Ukraine to justify escalating its attacks on the Ukrainian people. All right, what happens if chemical weapons are introduced, Dan? Yeah, so, I mean, listen, Putin's a KGB guy, so he's all about admit nothing, deny everything, and make some counter accusations. Russia has said that Ukraine is the one with a weapons of mass destruction program. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It's Putin who's used a banned chemical nerve agent, Novichok, overseas in the UK and against Navalny in Russia. He turned a FSB defector Litvinenko into a human dirty bomb by poisoning him with polonium-210. Uh, I think this is a legitimate concern. Russia enabled Syria's dictator Bashar al-Assad to use chemical weapons on innocent civilians, and we do have to be concerned about this. I, I think the likelihood is still low, uh, but it doesn't mean that it won't happen. It doesn't mean that the Biden administration shouldn't be messaging Russian military officials uh, about this and warning them off committing additional war crimes. We shall see. Dan Hoffman, thank you for your time and your service. We appreciate it. Thanks. Same to you. You got it. All right, Dr. Doom, Anthony Fauci, returns warning of even more COVID lockdowns if there's a spike. So we can't just say we're done. Now we're going to move on. We've got to be able to be flexible. Okay. But with variants getting weaker and weaker, can't we? I don't know what that means. Uh, Dr. Nicole Sapphire on deck coming up. When we found out her brother is a Belarusian soldier, she's desperate to get him to Ireland before he's potentially ordered into battle. There's plenty of space and plenty of donated supplies, but the search is on for more long-term accommodation. For now, it's the good-natured chaos of a warm family home, a million miles from the horrors of war. Stephen Murphy, Sky News, in County Meath. Well, let's see how the weather is shaping up. Look forward to brighter skies. Thanks to Realtor. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to this weekend's edition of This Week in Agribusiness. It's a pleasure to visit with you once more. We thank you for joining us. Mike Pearson is on vacation this weekend, but a few days ago, carbon was on his mind. He was talking with the folks from Agoro Carbon Alliance about the opportunities that farmers might have in the future. And Mike posed the question, what happens right after that grower signs a contract? So something that's very important to us at the Agoro Carbon Alliance is our, our customer success team, our grower success team. And our role is to work with growers after they've signed a contract to get them into the program. So whether it be uh, uploading their field boundaries, mapping their field boundaries, uploading their data, going through what data they need, we have a specific team that's working to help that grower walk through that process. We're not just going to sign that grower into a, into a contract and then say, okay, you're on your own, uh, figure it out. We have a specific team of agronomists that are focused on that part of the business. And it's incredible and it matters because these aren't short contracts. Can you tell us how long Agoro contracts are and why are they that length? So our contract term is 10 years and, and the reason these carbon market contracts are so long is because the buyers want to uh, they want to be purchasing real change and it takes a time to really see that change and accumulate soil carbon. 
It certainly does. Mark, what can a farmer expect from the support team as they're navigating these practice changes? So one thing that I'm very proud of to be a part of this team is that every one of our agronomists and grower success team members uh, personally believes in these practice changes in agronomics. And we all come from backgrounds that uh, have uh, these experiences in our in our careers. So we are all you know personal believers in this and we want to see these growers thrive when they implement these changes. So uh, we are going to be a resource to them throughout the length of their contract so that they are successful uh, while they're in contract with us. As we're You reach and stay up. The fire service who are working alongside border officials, registering refugees and transporting or to get raises. And yes, personally, I've always worn my hair however I chose. I've worn it straight, I've worn it braided, I've worn it spiked, I've worn it curly, I've worn it in a big natural, you name it. You name it. Everyone should be able to make those choices without fear of repercussion. Hair discrimination is rooted in systemic racism and is a real barrier to advancement and empowerment for our communities. Now, I've been fighting to end this discriminatory practice for years. In 2014, the women of the Congressional Black Caucus urged the Army to rescind Army Regulation 671 which prohibited many hairstyles worn by African-American women and other women of color. And, and I time led an amendment in the fiscal year expired. 15 defense appropriations bill to ban funding for this discriminatory General group. Lady will suspend. May I have another 30 seconds? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I yield the general lady another 30 seconds. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to remind you, we put this in the defense appropriations bill to ban funding for this discriminatory rule. The military understood it. And due to our advocacy a few years later, the U.S. Navy removed their discriminatory policy, allowing women, especially women of color, to wear their hair in dreadlocks, large burn, buns, braids, and ponytails. We owe it to ourselves and to future generations to take action here in Congress to break down these barriers. Everyone should be able to show up as their authentic selves, and passing the Crown Act is a major step in that direction. I urge my colleagues to vote yes, and I yield back. The gentleman from New York reserves. The gentleman from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Jordan is recognized. Uh, right. Well, Lawrence, first of all, you know, I think it is, would behoove us all if our nation's public health officials could uh, stop for a second and start to roll back some of the panic that they have inst instilled in the American people and stands with them in their hour of need. And there are multiple sclerosis. CNN national correspondent Camila Bernal has his story. Bombing has intensified. No way out. That was the last post from American James Hill before confirmation of his death. His Facebook detailing a chilling account of his last days in Ukraine. Intense bombing, still alive, limited food, room very cold. At one point a missile went by him and, and uh, landed at a, a distance. According to his family, Hill was waiting in a breadline with several other people when they were gunned down by Russian military snipers. His body was found in the street by the local police. Hill was in Chernihiv with his partner Ira, who's Ukrainian and battling MS. He was not going to uh, leave Ira's side in her condition. We're hanging in there, he wrote on Monday. Very cold inside. Food portions are reduced. Bombing and explosions most of the night. Hard to sleep people getting depressed. In his post, he describes feeling helpless, hungry, and cold while narrating a war. <laughs> Intense bombing last night for two hours. It was close to hospital. Machine gun fire could be heard. It stopped just after midnight. Hill even encouraging political action, posting this on March 7th. For my American friends and relatives, Please pressure your local representatives to expedite American visas for Ukrainians, especially for families with children and skilled workers. My brother was the helper that people find in a crisis. But while he wanted to help others and find a way out, it was too late. We don't know where my brother's body is, so that kind of closure 
the family won't have right now. And this, of course, devastating for his sister, for the rest of the family, and for his friends. Many who are now describing him as a caring, loving person who always had a positive attitude, who loved the outdoors, especially fly fishing. He kept in touch with a lot of these friends via Facebook, one of them even telling CNN that she essentially got a chance to say goodbye. Now his social media is filled with condolences, people honoring and remembering a friend, a brother, a teacher, and a brave man. Boris, Kristen. Well, here's a question we all want an answer to. Will adults need to get another booster shot to remain protected against COVID-19? We're going to bring you the very latest and try our best to answer that question right after this break. I don't just play someone brainy on TV. I'm an... It is not just a moral imperative. There is an enormous enthusiasm throughout our great country for extending a hand of hospitality and friendship. Britain is a country that always does right by those in need. We have a long, proud history of offering sanctuary. And that is why I launched the Ukrainian Family Scheme for Ukrainians with family ties to British nationals and people settled here in the UK. I'd already announced the extension of leave for Ukrainian nationals already here before Putin's invasion. And now those joining us through the family scheme will be granted the right to stay in the UK for three years, during which time they can work and they have access to public services. We want them to thrive here, just like the people we have welcomed from Syria, Hong Kong and Afghanistan. And in order to ensure that they do, we will make sure they have every means to do so. And it's not just Ukrainians with pre-existing links to the UK who are welcome. Those with no family ties can come here through our Homes for Ukraine scheme. Individuals, charities, community groups and businesses in the UK can apply to sponsor Ukrainians and bring them here safely. But above all, it is the generosity of the British people that is at the core of our country's response to this crisis. And we've seen hundreds of thousands of people offer up rooms in their homes, funding appeals which have soared. And behind every figure lies the story of a person or a family who can look forward to a better future because of the generosity of the British people. And we celebrate that. Yeah, yeah. But friends, it will not have escaped your notice that our opponents claim we do not care about the needy and the vulnerable. It is the opposite of the truth. Since 2015, we have resettled almost 25,000 men, women and children, seeking refuge from cruel circumstances across the world, more than any European country. As Home Secretary, I have given support to British national overseas status holders and their family members threatened by draconian security laws in Hong Kong, creating a pathway to citizenship for over 5 million people, with already 97,000 visas having been granted. And last summer, we led the largest evacuation since Dunkirk in Afghanistan. Under Conservative leadership, the United Kingdom has and will always provide sanctuary when the lights are being switched off on people's liberties. This government has focused on a post-Brexit immigration system that is open to the world and is fair, where we welcome the best and the brightest through a points-based system. The brilliant, dedicated doctors and nurses now able to come and use our fast-track visas to work in the NHS. And the brightest and the best scientists and academics who now benefit from the global talent route straight to the UK. This is our new plan for immigration in practice. Cracking down on the people smugglers means that we will have the capacity to help those genuinely fleeing fear of their lives. Safe and legal routes, like the ones for Ukrainians displaced by Putin's war, are vulnerable to the dangerous journeys across the channel organised by criminal gangs. And we have added measures to the National Anti and Borders Bill, introducing new visa penalty provisions for countries that pose a risk to international peace and our security. In her obviously tragic, sad news overnight with uh, Americans killed in this crash. As exercises continue yeah. in NATO countries, uh, your reaction? 
Well, this is just another example of the sacrifices that American military uh, men and women and families make. And my hearts and prayers are uh, with these families. We don't know really the details of this accident or, uh, or the situation there. I suspect we'll learn more today, but uh, we're keeping an eye on it and our, uh, our prayers are with these families. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the situation in Ukraine. Where do you think things are going? How do things stand? I know Zelensky came and spoke to um, members of Congress this past week. Uh, where are you at with that? Well, I, I believe that the Ukrainians are putting up a good, a good fight. I, I understand that the Ukrainian citizenry is very much behind their president. I'm getting the sense that they're not very interested in giving much up to the Russians at this point. The Ukrainian people believe that they're winning. I was uh, kind of learning more about the history of President Zelensky. He wasn't uh, very popular as a, a peacetime president. He is very popular now as a wartime president and he has rallied his uh, his people behind him and they are all in in this war to defend themselves and they're doing a fine job uh, as of as of yet and so i think the the coming days will be very telling i'm under, i understand there are negotiations going on with the russians but i think that president zelensky is really going to struggle to give much up to the russians at this point because the people he represents uh, feel like they're winning yeah. Congressman, we want to pivot here. Um, we hear that you and your colleagues in the House GOP are demanding a federal investigation to possible Russian financing of environmentalist uh, groups. Um, you just introduced the bill to require nonprofits to disclose the Russian donations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. This has been a two-year fight for me. In the final months of the Trump presidency, I asked the Justice Department to investigate where these environmental groups here in the U.S. are getting their money from. We have reason to believe that China and Russia are very much, in, much involved in the financing of these groups. Russia especially, uh, at this point, is uh, benefiting from the actions that our country and that the European Union have taken uh, over the years because the environmental groups have pushed these governments away from from their own domestic production and into the arms of Russia. Uh, the Russians are celebrating the reliance of the Europeans on their natural gas and the environmental groups, we believe, are getting funding from the Russians. And even Hillary Clinton in 2014 said that phony environmental groups funded by the Russians were doing everything they could uh, to stop U.S. fracking and domestic energy production. And that's I think that what uh, Moderna is trying to do is actually they're pretty smart is they're going ahead and saying, hey, listen, we make a recommendation for all populations, all age groups, so they don't have to piecemeal the data, so to speak. I think ultimately, Kristen, all of us will require those that are eligible to require vaccinations will need that second booster shot for the reasons that I just mentioned. I got my booster shot back in October, so I'm, I'm pretty much at that six-month mark where my antibodies are probably waning. And I think we absolutely have to take heed. We had five other warnings from Europe. What happens in Europe a few weeks later happens here in the U.S. So I think we should be prepared uh, for a possible booster shot or second booster shot for, first of all, adults 65 and older. So on that note, doctor, as cases of the BA2 variant are rising in the United Kingdom and, and across Europe, uh, what should the United States and the CDC be doing now to prepare for a potential surge? Right. I mean, you know, Boris, I've been very outspoken on social media, number one, for CDC's mask guidelines, where they said if you live in a low community level, you can take your mask off. I definitely don't think that it was worth taking our masks off, as Dr. Reiner had mentioned yesterday, for a month. It didn't make sense. Masks are basically the basic measure that we should keep to prevent the transmission of the virus. And we need to get prepared with these oral antiviral pills. The oral antiviral medication called Paxlovid by Pfizer really does help people who have COVID who are recovering at home. But I had to call about five pharmacies the other day to get it for an 82-year-old female. So do we have enough supplies? Do we have enough antibody infusions. And guess what? Just recently, Congress cut $15 billion in the uh, vaccine and pandemic preparedness plan that the White House had put forth. So I think that we're not really taking heed. We're not getting prepared. And as I mentioned one time as well on air, I think that we are all what we always do in the U.S. is react. We should be proactive 
and make sure that we're prepared ahead of time. Well, speaking of reacting, doctor, as you know, most states have already dropped almost all of their, their COVID restrictions, but Dr. Fauci says that the country must be able to go back to, and I'm quoting here, any degree of mitigation that is commensurate with what the situation is. So uh, I, I'm curious what you think. I mean, at this point, do you think that people are actually gonna go back to, to masking, social distancing, perhaps even remote learning uh, if they're asked? Uh, to be honest with you, Chris, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I think that is going to be a hard sell. You know, it's, it's been really difficult already. I think that for most of us, we've always been on our own to decide, you know, what should I do? The CDC has sent out a lot of mixed messaging, a lot of late messaging. And I think the current mask guidelines being prematurely lifted is just one way that America is saying we're tired of the pandemic. But look, I've always said the virus is not tired of us. We should still have the basic mitigation guidelines. I agree, if the cases are down, we should be able to back up. But a mask is a basic a mitigation guideline. Vaccines are basic. Booster shots are basic. And we should still live our lives, but we must do it cautiously. Dr. Saju Matthew, appreciate the expertise as always. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Legendary Duke coach Mike Krzyzewski is chasing a sixth and final national championship before he leaves the big stage. But as he heads into retirement, his greatest impact will be off the basketball court. When a youngster, uh, a young boy or a young girl comes through our doors, we want them to feel like there's hope, that there's somebody who's going to help them. But even more importantly, there's somebody who's going to believe in them. I got a lot of advice about five pounds. It'll come trailers. They've got three. I want you to see sell all of them. So that's what I did once I got better. He arrived in lemon seven and he ran the local lumber yard. His hobby was examining petrified wood found around the county. During the early years of the depression, he helped employ many local folks, building the Petrified Sculpture Garden. And nearly 100 years later, the city of Lemon maintains the park. The Bainbridge family, they know a thing or two about century-long traditions. 2020 is the 101st harvest for this Ethan, South Dakota family. Born and raised on the farm, his sons, Matt and Neil. The lactose, so you can enjoy it even if you're sensitive to dairy. Anything to make you smile and care with the very universal values which we as conservatives hold dear to our hearts. The preciousness of freedom, safety and security which unite and bring us together. We value the enormous benefits of living in a free and safe society and we must always be resolute in our determination to safeguard them. What is happening in Ukraine is the saddest reminder of the depths to which humanity can sink to strike out those values. Our duty is to safeguard our country's interests and to be reliable and supportive to our friends who share our values. It is right that we do everything that we can to help Ukraine in this hour of need. And my friends, it's not just for their peace, freedom and security. But for the very values and the freedoms we all cherish and live our lives by. Thank you. Thanks very much. Secretary Priti Patel there speaking at the Conservative Party Spring Conference. And she talked about the trip to Poland two weeks ago, describing the people fleeing the war in Ukraine. She was in, if you remember, Medica at the start of the month there. And she praised the work of the Polish people welcoming in the refugees from Ukraine. And she also described Putin as the aggressor in this war. Now, they're staying with the war in Ukraine, and Russia's president has praised his country's operation in Ukraine and what he called the heroic efforts of his troops. Sky News witnessed civilians being hit from the ground and the air near to Kiev. Six buildings, including a preschool, were damaged in the attack in the city's Podil neighborhood, just north of the city center and about 1.5 miles from the government quarter holding the presidential palace. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, sent this report. This is... Dead. Great places, great places, South Dakota.
We're back with a Fox weather alert. Florida and Georgia are bracing for a tornado threat. The strongest storms expected close. That's because Operations Center provides insights you can access anytime. Max. I will. Thanks. For the original style as was done to young girls is processed. It burned beyond recognition. And I went out with my grandmother, a woman of tradition, and fearful for me, she asked me to go back because she couldn't walk with me with an afro. The reason, of course, was her fear, what an afro sign signified what it would do, how I would be harmed. Those were the conflicts and strife that black people went through trying to come to grips with their identity. My good friend, Mr. Jordan, uh, we never encounter each other because we have mutual respect, as I do for you and you do for Sheila Jackson Lee. We don't really get into it because we know uh, we're the kind of folk uh, that stand down from each other. But I enjoy engaging with you. I enjoy your leadership. And your constituents have every right to be concerned about gas prices. My, my constituents are concerned about eating, being able to pay their rent. And I believe we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Let's get together about gas prices and paying rent and people eating and having jobs and ending discrimination. Why can't we do that together? because you have not walked in my skin. You've got to understand what it means when we are talking about a report that has been given. In 2019, the Joy Collective, the Crown Act Coalition, disproportionately burdened by policies black people are and practices in public places, including the workplace, that target, profile, or sing them out for their natural hairstyles. The Crown study found that black women's hair is more police in the workplace. His time has expired. Gentle lady, an additional 30 seconds. Gentle lady is recognized for Thereby 30 contributing seconds. to the climate of group control. Black women are more likely to receive formal grooming policies. And 80% of black women believe that they had to change their hair to be in the workplace. Just imagine, just imagine the beauty of these hairstyles. Mr. Jordan, the beauty of these hairstyles, this is what we're talking about people who are severely discriminated against, young boys, young girls, a little girl in a Catholic school could not wear her hair, had to go home. The fabulous Serena, who gives joy to all of us, and yet these are the locks that she is wearing. Can I get another 15? I thank you for recognizing. I grant the, grant the general aid an additional 15 seconds. I thank you, the chairman, very much. And this young boy, who, like me, was felt diminished because someone thought it was wrong for me, an afro for him, his braided hair. Mr. Jordan, we have engaged in a lot.